Today, I'm going to be reviewing the Kef R5, uh, what they call a compact floor standing speaker. This speaker was sent to me by the owner. He actually ordered it and have it drop shipped to me directly from a retailer. And I only got one of them because he was not necessarily sure if he wanted to run a pair of these or not. And he wasn't really willing to risk the, uh, the cost to buy both and not wind up using them. So he asked if I would be willing to test one. So here we are. Now, I will say that I just mentioned I only had one, so I wasn't really able to do stereo listening. And I'll be completely honest, I've done a lot of mono listening to speakers lately, and I'm kind of sick of it. I miss being able to listen in stereo. So I didn't really do a whole lot of subjective listening on, on this speaker. I mean, I did listen to it for a little bit, but it's not like I sat down with it for a very long period of time or multiple days like I normally try to do. Uh, I basically just kind of listened to the speaker verified that nothing was really wrong per se. Um, and then I went on about my way for measuring. And that's what we're really going to talk about today. So uh, to be, you know, I guess quick and upfront about the subjective side of things. Yeah, there really wasn't anything bad about the speaker. At this point now, I've listened to quite a few Kef speakers, the R2C, um, the R8A, which is their Atmos speaker. And I tested the R3, of well, probably about four or five, maybe six months ago. So I've heard a lot of these R series speakers, and there's really not much different about these that I haven't heard with the other ones, except for there is a little bit more bass output um, on the lower end, but it kind of does a little bit of a funky thing on the bass, and we'll get to that below. That doesn't really matter as far as what I heard. Um, it just doesn't sound as full in the 80 hertz region as I would have expected these to. Now, again, they are compact. You know, They're not very wide speakers, they're rather kind of narrow They're uh, just looking at the baffle. I'd say they're probably about seven inches across, if that. I mean, they're really just not a very wide speaker. Uh, you can pull up the specs from manufacturer. I don't waste my time doing that, and I don't want to waste your time giving you the whole spiel there. But again, they're a very compact floor standing speaker. Um, so at my website, I've got all of this data, and I will link this below in the description. And here is a picture of the Kef R5 just kind of set up on a roller. And let's see. Another picture in the back, you can see that there are two ports. There's one toward the top and there is one toward the bottom. And there is the multi-way binding post where you can buy amplify the speaker if you want. Uh, is there anything else I want to note about the speaker? Let's see here. I did test it with the microphone placed at the center. So right here, that's the reference point. Now I took this outside, also did a ground plane measurement just to make sure that my uh, base summation was set up properly in the clip on near field scanner. And the Klippel near field scanner is a measurement device. It's fully robotic that allows you to measure a speaker in a non-anechoic environment, such as my garage, as you see here, but get anechoic results. So it basically takes the room out of the response and allows us to quantify what the speaker uh, behaves like when it's not in a room. And the reason that's important is because you can take that information, roll it all up into a nice, pretty package, and get a very good representation of how the speaker is going to present itself to you in an actual room. And we can do that by looking at the estimated in-room response curve. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And if you're curious about what the near fill scanner is in more detail, I've got an interview with Christian Bellman, who is one of the uh, designers of the Clipple near fill scanner. So you can go and check that out. I've actually got a link directly on my website. If you want to watch it, it's about a two hour discussion. And it's chock full of information if you're interested. A pair of speakers, let's see here, runs about uh, 1650 for a single. So you're looking at about 3300 for a pair of speakers. And here we have the CEA 2034 data for the Kef R5. Now, if you don't know what the CEA 2034 data means, I have a whole series of what measurements mean. And I'll throw that playlist up in the corner here. Just click this card and watch all those. This will explain all the measurements you're about to see. And I'm really going to focus on the highlights. And with that said, let's go ahead and jump right into the on-axis response, which is in black. And looking through the mid-range to the high frequency area, it's mostly neutral speaker. We do see some things going on here. Um, this looks like some sort of resonance at around 270 hertz. Uh, there's some peaking and dipping going on here, but these are mostly low enough in level that I don't think they're really going to be a, a major issue. If you do hear them, it might present itself to you as maybe a slight annoyance, but it was nothing that I heard in my listening. And I would say that you're probably going to have to try to listen for these low level resonances. 
I wouldn't say it's anything to be concerned about. Then if you go higher in frequency, the crossover region is at point or 2.9 kilohertz, which is right in here. And if we look at the sound power response, we can see that, yeah, there is a little bit of a, a difference in the directivity shift right here, but it's not significant by going down here and looking at the directivity indices versus the listening window response. And really what I'm looking for here is just smooth trend lines, right? Anywhere there is not a smooth trend line, it's a sign of a resonance or it's a sign of a crossover mismatch. The good thing about the Unity, or I'm sorry, the UniQ speaker, is that they really don't have those kind of issues in regards to crossover mismatch. They do a really good job of keeping the uh, beam width pretty uh, constant throughout the mid-range to the tweeter in that crossover region. And we do see a slight dip, which indicates there is a little bit of a mismatch there, but it's not significant. I've certainly seen a whole lot worse. And this really is where the UniQ from Kef shines. It does a really good job of creating a point source image where I think, in my personal opinion, the soundstage depth is really quite nice. The layering within the soundstage is really, really nice. And the focus of the images within the soundstage is also really nice. The only soundstage attribute that I'm personally not fond of, and you probably heard me say this about a billion times already with regard to Kef, is that they tend to not have a very wide radiation pattern. And that's a personal thing. Now, if you have a very reverberant room, you may actually prefer a non-wide uh, radiation pattern because it keeps more of the sound directed toward you instead of having it bounce off the walls and have a lot of uh, coloration from the reflections in that regard. But also the good thing about this UniQ speaker is even everything that's reflected off the walls comes back to you and it's close in timbre to the direct sound that you hear first. So there is no kind of uh, appearance that things are kind of mucked up within the soundstage. Uh, the timbre matching is really quite nice as well in that regard too. So the only thing that I personally am troubled by in this data is the low frequency response. It doesn't extend as low as I personally would want. Uh, the fact that it's ported kind of shows some issues to me. I think I would prefer for this speaker to be sealed and you can actually stuff the ports. I did not test it that way due to time constraints, but we're gonna look at it just from this perspective only. So if we draw an imaginary line around 86 dB as an average sensitivity, we can see that F3 is somewhere around this 60, 50 hertz region. Uh, and I'll have more on that in a little bit. And going below that, we can see that there's a dip here. Now this is where the mid woofers meet up to the port. And there's the design here. I don't know if this is purposely designed this way, but just looking at the data, it makes me think that maybe the port tuning is a little bit too low. And maybe if the tuning was a little bit higher, it would kind of get rid of this null right here. Now, it certainly is plausible that this is done on purpose and Kef has engineered the speaker to have that dip in the, at that particular frequency. It's, per, it's certainly plausible, um, but just looking at the data and not having any other additional insight into that, my takeaway from this is I would personally prefer to have a higher tuning frequency and or maybe just actually just seal up the enclosure altogether and not have ports because matching to a ported speaker with subwoofer response, especially when you're getting lower in frequency where the wavelength is so long and trying to get the phase response between midwoofers and subwoofers right, that's really tough. And for those reasons, I kind of sometimes tend to lean more toward a sealed design, but that's purely personal. Um, if you like ported speakers, that's great. I'm not saying things wrong with ported speakers, but I'm just giving you my two cents, okay? Is there anything else in here that I think is worth mentioning? Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of jaggies going on here, but I, I really don't think that a lot of this stuff is going to be audible. That's the one thing about the anechoic data is that it allows you to see very minute resonances, but the audibility of these things, uh, most of the time is kind of going to be, or the appearance of audibility is going to be over, overtaken, I guess, or over overestimated. So I usually kind of just manually, mentally, mentally is the word I'm looking for there, uh, just kind of filter these out in my head and then I kind of look for the trend lines that are going on. So if you do that overall, the speaker looks pretty good. And now we are looking at the estimated in-room response. And I keep saying the same thing over and over. Generally, what you're looking for are the trends, right? So if I were to draw an imaginary line through here, we can see that 
let's see, right around the two and a half kilohertz region, there's a minor bump. There's a dip around three and then a flat plateau above about four up into five kilohertz or so. And what I would take away from this based on my experience thus far is that this speaker to some may sound um, a little bit bright, but this is more of a personal preference thing. And, and you can knock this down by dB and it might sound completely fine to me. Others may hear this and think it's not bright enough. And this is part of the area where understanding the measurements, knowing what measurements of a good speaker to you versus a bad speaker to you are. And then that way you're able to fine tune what you're, what you're looking at, what you want to buy. And just again, based on my experience, I can tell you that I would hear this, this speaker is maybe just about a dB too high in the high frequency area. This right here may cause itself to stand out a little bit more in the presence region, something you may prefer, something you may not. Um, but then again, we're looking at this dip now, luckily on the low frequency, and I say luckily, it's really not luckily, but the room response takes over so much down here that you're gonna have to use EQ, and this speaker will reply to EQ pretty well. Uh, just make sure you don't run out of steam because uh, it's five and a quarter inch midwoofers. It's not like dual eights or anything, and you'll probably still need to run a good subwoofer. So now let's talk about the radiation pattern for the speaker. Through the mid range up into about three and a half kilohertz, the radiation is narrowing in frequency, uh, but it's narrowing pretty linearly. And what I mean by that is you can kind of draw a straight line through here and it doesn't follow this 60 degree angle. It starts off at about 90 degrees at the, what, five, 800 Hertz region. And then it just continues to progressively get more narrow until you get to about 3.2 kilohertz and you're at about 50 degrees wide. So it's one of those things where it's gonna give you an idea of how it's gonna behave in your room, uh, whether or not you're gonna need absorption is kind of dependent as well upon the size of your room and the interaction that you may or may not prefer. But the good thing about this speaker is that it's somewhat constant in its beam pattern, meaning that it's not jumping in and out all over the place like some lesser speakers would do. And that's a good sign. Now, in terms of the vertical response, you can see that the speaker is pretty constant around 60 degrees plus or minus, well, maybe plus six degrees. Um, and yeah, maybe minus six degrees. But then when you get to this crossover region, you definitely have a, a change over where you're not nearly as omnidirectional anymore. And you are, uh, in fact, more or less beaming right through this area. And that relates to about, let me draw this backwards. Uh, yeah, right around that crossover region, as I said. And then the tweeter gets wider out through here. So there's just a little bit of a dip in this crossover region. Uh, whether or not that's going to be problematic, I, I really can't tell you. The verdict is still really out on vertical directivity and how we hear the... Um, the beam went through that region. And there's actually a discussion I had with Dr. Floyd Tool about that. And, and that was pretty much his takeaway. And I'll try to remember to link that up here if I can. And this is the on-axis response linearity. You can see that you're mostly plus or minus one and a half dB above the 200 Hertz region. But then you've got this dip in a response of about a, what is that? Maybe half a dB to a dB. And then you roll off. So the F3 is actually at 77 Hertz. I misspoke earlier. Uh, the F10 is at 33 Hertz. So it's not really a steep roll off. Um, the combination of the port, it looks like they put the port a little bit lower to extend the low frequency out because if they had pushed it here, like I was talking about, then your F10 would be closer to maybe 45 Hertz or something like that rather than 33. So I think maybe I understand why they did that. Um, personally, however, it's not maybe a decision that I think I would have made, but I'm not a loudspeaker engineer and I don't get to make those calls. So this is purely anecdotal. Okay. All right. Uh, the impedance, let's look at the impedance real fast and just check out the min impedance does dip to around, what is that? Maybe three and a half uh, ohm at about 150 Hertz. But for the most part, it's well above uh, four ohm. And when you get into the base down here, as long as you're using a proper crossover, you won't really have to worry about any of the four ohm. So an AVR, most modern AVR should be able to power the speaker without real issues. Um, but I would also make sure with the manufacturer of your AVR that it can do that if you are limited to using only an AVR. And here is the near field response measurements of each of the components. The black is the anechoic on axis, so it's the far field response. Uh, the blue is the mid tweeter. The pink, well, actually purple, I'm sorry, are the mid woofers. And this is just the mic kind of in between space 
uh, to give me an idea of where the crossover is. And then on the low end, you've got the port, and I just measured the single port. They actually could behave a little bit differently, uh, but I think this actually tells me the story that I needed to know pretty well uh, about what was going on with this dip. And sure enough, yeah, it is, it is the port uh, doing that. Now, the other port may actually be causing this bump right here. I'm not really sure again, but uh, I didn't really see the point in measuring every single component because the far fill is what matters. And really, more or less, I just wanted a sanity check this guy right here. And speaking of sanity checks, I also did take this outdoors and measure it in a ground plane method and uh, got the same result for the on-axis response, at least up into the high frequency where the ground plane measurement is not very uh, useful. Harmonic distortion. You're below about 1% THD at 86 dB. The main things that you want to know is that negative 40 dB is 1%, negative 30 dB is 3%. And those are just visual cues to look for. So in terms of distortion at 86 dB at one meter, no problems here for me. And then at 96 dB, that's when we start to kind of run out of steam with this speaker. Uh, it increases above 1% at about 100 Hertz. You're about 3% on the low end, but if you use a proper crossover, again, maybe say 80 Hertz, you're gonna take some load off of this speaker and I don't really think you're gonna to have to worry about distortion. However, uh, in terms of compression and enhancement, this is where you kind of want to keep things in check and keep expectations in check, right? Going from 76 to 86 dB, there's not much shift in the red. You're, you're within like a quarter dB. Going from 76 to 96 dB, uh, you're within a half a dB on the low end. But going from 76 to 102 dB, you're losing a dB uh, due to compression at about 150 hertz. And uh, you're gaining a little bit on the on the on the 80 hertz region, but the main thing is is you're losing about a dB down here, and you're also really chopping off stuff in the high frequency. And I find this kind of interesting. And and what this data tells me is this speaker is good for you know middle volume listening, maybe even high volume listening at typical seating distances, but without a proper crossover, you are definitely going to run into limitations of the speaker. Uh, use it with a subwoofer and uh, and a, as a pair of speakers at about three to four meters, there should be enough volume for anybody. I wouldn't really be too concerned about that. The only thing that really bothered me was was this, but you gotta think if you're listening to these speakers in a, as a pair at 102 dB, so that's 108 dB, and then in room is about 111 dB, and then you take the distance away, so you're back to around maybe 100 dB. That's really, really loud, and I don't think that anybody's gonna push these speakers that high and, and notice uh, that because your ears are probably already going to be having an issue. So that's just my, my two cents on that. Long-term compression, 86 dB, no change. Long-term compression for 96 dB, there is a little bit of a change in the high frequency area. And this is one of those things where it makes me wonder, is that due to some kind of intermodulation where the, the cone is moving and it's maybe altering the high frequency effects? I don't know, but it is interesting. So I, I just thought I would throw that out there. And that's going to do it for this speaker. If you're looking for, you know, a, a summary of what I think about the performance, uh, overall, I think it's a good performance for a compact, again, compact floor standing speaker. Um, I'll be honest with you, though, it's not something that I would personally buy. And that's not so much because of the performance. I think the performance is okay. And I really do love Kef's concentric designs. I just personally don't like slim looking towers. I, to me, if I'm going to buy a tower, I want to buy a tower that's kind of meaty. Um, I just, slim looking towers, I actually owned the R500 uh, a while back, like six or seven years ago, and it sounded great, but I just want an, um, an imposing looking tower speaker. Um, if you own these speakers, man, I'm not I'm not knocking it at all. I mean, it's just a personal thing. I would, I would love uh, maybe like the, what is it, R11, maybe, whichever one that has the, the larger woofers. Those are the ones I would personally like to see more of. But anyway, that's just my two cents, and you don't have to agree, obviously, but there's the data for you to make a better informed decision. And I do want to say thank you for you watching. Uh, if you are into this kind of stuff and you are not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button. That would help me out. And uh, I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.